Uh, welcome uh, everybody to the last uh, interview of our uh, Envisioning the Global South uh, seminar series. In the past months, we had the chance to host a range of fantastic speakers from uh, Dr. Ali Ahmeda, Gillian Schwedler, uh, Deeper Chakrabarti, Jemima, Jemima Pierre, uh, Luis Slava, who have all given the chance to reflect upon uh, the main questions that this seminar series uh, hoped to address. And I briefly, I just want to you know, remind you with, with which one they were. We, how has the Global South been perceived and crafted in historical sources, uh, colonial legacies, international relations and policies, what crucial elements and issues have contributed to such visions, and how can post-decolonial post or decolonial approaches within the social sciences and the humanities unsettle long-lasting understanding of the Global South. So uh, today, adding to the list of these great speakers, we have the chance and the pleasure to host uh, Dr. Nivi Manchanda, Senior Lecturer in uh, International Politics, Associate Professor at uh, Queen Mary University of London. Nivi, it is a great pleasure to have you here today. Uh, centering the questions of race and racism uh, uh, in the ways knowledge is produced in the field of IR, Nivi, Nivi has, uh, has not only edited a book on such topic, uh, uh, together with Robbie Shilliam and uh, Alex Anievas. More recently, and precisely last year, in 2020, she has come out with a tour de force book, uh, theoretically and empirically, a very a fascinating book, honestly, on the ways in which Afghanistan has been relentlessly managed, imagined through the works of American and British uh, military and academic experts from the 19th century up to the present day. Personally, I would like to say that Nivi's work uh, uh, has given me the chance to develop and, and think through my own research questions, but has also provided the space to reflect upon uh, the limitations, the possibilities of the academic field, which, as much as it remains a site of control and, uh, and discipline, through which the wealth of ideas uh, uh, re, you know, are, produce, are required to maintain the dominant structure of power are produced, it can also, you know, it, the academic field can also become a site to rethink and push back a type of knowledge production that remains overly Eurocentric, masculinist, and too often bent to the maintenance of the capitalist system of social reproduction. So it is uh, with great pleasure again that, uh, you know, we have Nivi here and uh, I would like to start this interview with uh, one question, Nivi, that um, in a way it's, it's, uh, it's about your book, but it's also about another book. And in fact, I would like, uh, since your book is about, is a decolonizing intervention into, this, into the field of uh, Afghanistan studies and the global south and these imperial tropes. So the question I'd like to ask you is to reflect upon this book that you analyze uh, extensively in, uh, in your own, uh, in your own man manuscript, which is, and I'm going to share just uh, on the screen, just uh, you can see, everybody can see it, the cover of the book, which is Afghanistan one-on-one, -on -one, understanding Afghan culture. So Nivi, let us imagine now this hypothetical scenario. Nobody, and I haven't read your book, but I have read this book. What kind of uh, image, imagination of Afghanistan are we presented with? Uh, thanks, Mateo, and thanks also for your very generous introduction. I'm really pleased to be here and to be able to talk to you all. Um, in terms of Esan Entezar's Afghanistan 101, I think it really is a book that crystallizes some of the concerns I have with knowledge production in the West. Um, so as Esan Entezar, who was, who is an Afghan, so I want to also not say that the West is some sort of homo homogenous entity where, which does not also interpolate Eastern subjects into it, right? So lots of people from the global South move on to the global North as it were, and then become Western producers of knowledge. So I'm interested in the Western Academy um, and, and also policy, of course, but Esan Entezar, has this short sort of introduction to Afghan culture, as he calls it, um, and it's 150 pages. And in it, he aims to, or sets out to explain Afghanistan 
to the West to make it sort of palatable, to make it legible. Um, and uh, he's based at Columbia, or was based at Columbia. And the book is uh, based on his experience of Afghanistan, or that's how at least he sets it out. Um, and as you saw with that cover, uh, it is extremely stereotypical uh, and extremely what we would want as a Western sort of audience to know about Afghanistan so that the intervention can then just be justified and looked upon as a positive thing. So women are not just subjugated, they are beaten. Afghans only respect authority in the form of a strong male figure. There's no democracy. Um, they, they don't, they shout at each other. And that the whole, the whole time, what is interesting about this book is that not only does Entazar completely stereotype Afghanistan by these wide generalizations, he also seeks to posit uh, the West and specifically the US as a counterpoint to that. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this kind of knowledge production is not just, and this is what something that Said also says, it's not just about the East, it's also about us and our interpretations of ourselves and the image we show. So in contrast to the US, which is balanced and rational and humanitarian, Afghanistan is a man, uh, is, a, is, a, like a, is a country of misogynistic men. They like to beat up their children. They like to cover up their wives. They don't like animals. There's this, all this stuff. And in a way, one could say, well, you know, this is clearly the musings of one person. Why does it matter? But the book has been picked up extensively. It's on the, it was on the US Marines core reading list before they were deployed into Afghanistan. It is also given to loads of NGO workers who go into wow. Afghanistan. So this is often the information and the knowledge that is gleaned by people who are going to go into Afghanistan and interact with it. So it becomes like a primer to Afghanistan, which is clearly what Entazar himself wants to do. And he achieves that. But I was really stunned, even though this was something I was researching and I knew that this was happening, but I was really stunned just how extensive and violent those generalizations were and also their repercussions. So there's a lot of stuff on Afghan corruption and that has been picked up by NGOs and aid and the aid industry. And I think Norway, for instance, got its um, aid to Afghanistan by quite a lot based on the research in this book about Afghan corruption, except it isn't really research, it's anecdote. He just says that Af Afghanistan is corrupt. I can go into the problems with the aid industry, which is a different matter, but the, but the focus here for me was this little book, which became a source of knowledge, a window, if you like, into Afghanistan based on hardly any research his cred credentials are that he once lived in Afghanistan and that was it um, and, and then has been picked up widely and so yes it is it does crystallize some of my themes pretty well. Thanks Navy. thank you so much I mean uh, um, I guess uh, this book uh, yes is ar archetypical in a way uh, is an archetype of what of what you've trying you know what you did what you actually have done in the book in the sense of really debunking these tropes uh, when it comes to Afghanistan but I wonder I mean if you had uh, during your journey to write this book and I mean obviously this is part uh, loosely based on your also on your doctoral research did you had a uh, you know, how many times have you been confronted with this type of knowledge about Afghanistan? I mean, was there a moment, a trigger, and not a sort of epiphany in a way, but, uh, you know, when did you start facing relentlessly this over and over? I mean, was there through the media, you know, it, there must be a moment I, I wonder where, you know, you, why is this happening and what brought you in a way to, to write this book? Yeah, so I suppose, to answer your first question first, in terms of when did I start encountering that, I think the media are always complicit in orientalizing, and it isn't just to do with Afghanistan. The thing I found particularly interesting about Afghanistan was how uh, complicit the academy and policy research was mm -hmm. too, and just how thin the sort of knowledge edifice that some of these assumptions were based on, and specifically how much of that was based on British colonial memoirs mm. and colonial interactions. So there's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy where um, <laughs> Afghanistan is created as backwards, as tribal, but then that knowledge is based not on extensive ethnography in the 21st century, but on 19th century memoirs and accounts 
of colonial administrators. So that I think was was the the sort of slightly different thing, if you like. I mean, there's other countries who also have that. I'm sure if you look at Somalia, maybe even Libya, there's those representations. I'm not saying Afghanistan is unique, but it was particular, um, especially in relation to some of the more sort of uh, institutionally colonized countries. Um, and this is why I talk about Afghanistan's quasi-colonialism. It's not quite a properly colonized country the way India was or the Congo in some ways was or, or, or Algeria. Although again, those countries have their own specific colonial enterprises in the form of the British and the, um, the French and the Belgian, but also, uh, but, but, but there is some sort of understanding that these were colonial uh, enterprises that the British ruled or the French ruled, et cetera. And Afghanistan never was ruled properly. It was always this pawn between two entities, the British and the Russian, and it was considered the sort of buffer or the outlier before the meaningful entity of British India, which is the jewel in the crown. And so it was always controlled and treated as such, but never got the resources or the, or the sort of um, epistemic uh, inquiry dedicated to it that you see in other places. Um, and, and so I suppose that, that became more and more evident as I went along. Why Afghanistan? Uh, I started to do this research on um, the sort of war on terror, which I was interested in, much like everybody else was interested in, say, 10 years ago. Um, and I was especially interested in the US in, in Iraq. And the thing that struck me was that the longer war, the war in Afghanistan, had actually been studied much less, was less in the news, was sort of ignored. And so I started pivoting towards Afghanistan. And the more I researched, it was almost as though the less I knew, because it was all based on these sort of tropes and stereotypes that have been recycled over the years. Thanks, Nevi. Um, uh, precisely building on, uh, you know, there is you you constantly go back uh, when you say that this was not just a media issue, it was not just an academic issue, it was also a policy issue. And I'm interested in that because there is one of the tropes that you analyze in your book, one of the existing one that is constantly comes back when talking about Afghanistan, is the one of state failure and state collapse. Now, uh, and I am sure many of us agree with, uh, with, uh, with, with this, is the fact that uh, state failure and state collapse could actually be a label uh, to identify the majority of the world from the, according to the North when looking at the South. So, I mean, uh, since you really make, I mean, you take Afghanistan to make a, a, a theoretical contribution to the south of the world, I think. I mean, that's the way I've, I've been reading the, your book. So, I mean, if you can, if you can talk and expand a little bit on, the, on this state failure and state collapse and, you know, that you, you, know, you mentioned briefly before. Yeah, so there's the, the obvious sort of uh, nominal or naming issue where, you, where British... American, European, Western companies and other states label some states as rogue or as failed. And this, the, the failure of the Afghan state was one of the reasons for intervention, right? So it was a, oh, this state has been overrun by the Taliban. It has had all this terrorist activity. Um, its women and children have been failed and by any measure, and there's these in indices of state failure, which are published, which says, what is, the, what is the level of corruption or government capture, et cetera. And so Afghanistan met all these and has always been at the top of the, or like the first or the second or the third country in these lists of state failure. And the problem of course is one, that what we consider state failure is, is um, in itself self-perpetuating. So, you know, if you say that this country is failed and therefore don't, do anything about it or don't like look at it as, as a problem to be solved without paying attention to the context to the history to the to the thing to the ways in which we as the west have been complicit in and implicated in creating that very state of failure then it becomes something that is just to be studied from the outside and to be intervened on as we see fit that that is one of the problems of state failure in itself and then of course there is also uh the question of what we consider failure. So for instance, if you look at 
corruption, what happens to countries that do have institutionalized corruption, but it isn't considered corruption, it's considered lobbying. So the United States has looked billions of dollars funded and funneled through its sort of election system, uh, but that is not considered corruption. Whereas a policeman at the side of the street earning you know, 20 pence becomes a form of massive corruption that needs to be tackled. So there's also the sort of structures that enable one state to be called failed while the other is considered uh, not state, not failed. And that, of course, goes back to questions of asymmetry, of power, and of years of uh, Western supremacy, I would argue. Indeed, yeah, indeed, indeed. Thanks, Navy. I mean, uh, um, what, uh, it, it definitely, it makes me think of so much about uh, also, because when you're talking about uh, Afghanistan one-on-one, -on -one, and then when you refer to the question of the state, there is, uh, you really put it well when you are describing the fact that there is this sense in the academy where there is there is a need to produce this kind of commonsensical knowledge. I think you you describe you you call it, and uh, I mean the dangers of this. I think it's uh, it's just incredible how much we you know one on the one hand is uh, is called up to to make an impact with the type of research that needs that is being produced, but at the same time. How are you going to filter, uh, you know, this knowledge uh, to an audience that wants to wa just wants to think about state failure and state collapse? And uh, I mean, your book is fantastic in really demolishing this kind of the supremacist, white supremacist, and Western supremacy look imagination of the global South. But uh, I mean, I I can see that this is this is very difficult when it comes, you know, to impact and uh, policy impact or. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if, if you want to have any, any thoughts on this, please go ahead, Nimi. I mean, it's just... Uh... I mean, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And this is something that we often confront. Uh, and it is the limits of our own research in some ways, because we are not really speaking to the audiences that we're critiquing. We're mostly yeah. ending up having a conversation amongst either like-minded scholars or people who are interested, but definitely don't have the sort of power to change things the way, you know, like Biden is not going to be reading this book, that's for sure. No. So, um, yeah, so I think I, I agree with you. And I, I suppose uh, the one thing I would say is that um, often with scholarly pursuits, it takes a while for that yeah. to trickle down, um, I suppose, or for it to like permeate the, mm -hmm. the cultural policy sphere. And that happens with work on pretty arcane things like queer theory. And so perhaps yeah. queer theory is not immediately used as a way to tease out gender differences and the like the ways in which we think about binaries, et cetera, but because it is written in a way that isn't immediately accessible to everyone, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact. The impact is felt through years down the line, gets into popular, yeah. popular culture. And then when people are interested, they can look back and say, okay, this is, how Judith Butler helped us make sense of this, even though when we read her, we didn't really understand her or we didn't read her at all. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not what I'm saying about this particular work, but I'm just saying that there is that um, yeah. thing with, with uh, scholarly discourse of this sort. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yes, totally. And uh, I, I mean, going back to the tropes, I would like you to take on, uh, on two different questions here now that I'd like you to reflect on. On the one hand, there is, uh, even before you mentioned about, there are two elements that uh, are very curse, cursory you, uh, there is a cursory use of this element. One, it's history and one, it's culture, when it comes to the formulation of the, of the imagination of Afghanistan in, in the mind of Western experts and audience. And then there is the issue of logics. Uh, let's start with history and culture, because I mean, I know you write this about in the book, so, uh, you know, if I would like to, you know, to un let you to unpack about this a little bit. Yeah, I think um, history and culture are actually obviously related, so it's not easy to talk about one without the other. But uh, the one thing I'd like to say is that history is by far from perfect science. So what I'm not saying is that Afghanistan hasn't been historically correctly studied. What I'm saying is that there is a an ahistoricity and a lack of historical sensitivity when it comes to Afghanistan, and that goes back to some of the stuff I was saying earlier, because it hasn't been engaged with in the same sort of way as other places, and it's always considered sort of marginal or peripheral or liminal, this idea that 
it's just a land of wild tribes uh, has seemed to have gotten hold of itself and a life of its own. Um, and and um, some of these some of these sort of tropes do do have material consequences and also have ramifications in that they become the truth or they take on their own sort of meaning on the ground. And one of the things that um, one of the sort of tropes about uh, Afghanistan's people being hardy wa warriors and Afghanistan being the like uh, the the graveyard of empires uh, mm -hmm. is especially provocative. But a lot of the things that we attribute to Afghanistan being this graveyard are not really studied properly. So Afghanistan, because of one painting, it is said that Afghanistan holistically defeated the the British, because there's the there's an image of Lord uh, of the Doctor Bryden riding on on a on a horse, and it looks like all of the rest of the British army had been vanquished. This was definitely not true. Uh, you know, the, the reality was much more complex. The Britain had been defeated perhaps in some of the battles in the first Anglo-Afghan war and the second Anglo-Afghan war, but it was more complex and messy than that. La uh, similarly, when we talk about um, the Mujahideen and these like warriors that seem to have defeated uh, the Soviet Union, a much more technologically impressive force, the truth is that actually the Mujahideen were being funneled stinger missiles from the Reagan administration. So, so then when you talk about the, these, you know, hardy warriors without any, uh, any weaponry, that's absolutely not true. But that then becomes the story we, talk, we tell ourselves about Afghanistan. And then policy, military, academic discourse then kind of builds on that. So there's just there's layers of things that go on. Um, and, and in that way, the historical stuff feeds in to the cultural stuff. So then the Afghanistan becomes this culture that is warrior-like and has its own connotations, is, is um, misogynistic, is homophobic, is, you know, all those things. So it's very hard to distinguish between those two, but I feel like the sort of cultural assumptions, which is actually quite, quite wide in, in the sense that we culturally stereotype the East anyway, like that is, yeah. you know. Uh, everybody has said that, and Said has shown it masterfully. Um, but uh, but a lot of that still, those cultural assumptions still, when you scrape the surface, there's some sort of historical narrative that upholds that. And the narratives around uh, with Afghanistan are actually sometimes based on fiction, quite a lot of times based on anecdotal incidents, and a lot of times on things that we've that we as in the UK or, or the US or imperial powers in general have done and tried to dis disavow. And I think that's that's where the story becomes a little bit more interesting, a little bit more messy. Yeah, and uh, I, I want to build exactly on what you said at the end when you talk about the disavowal. You know, in your book, you, you describe these two logics taking place uh, when approaching Afghanistan in depicting Afghanistan. On the one hand, there is the logic of difference. The, on the other hand, there is the logic of disavowal. I was particularly struck uh, when you talk about Afghanistan as a familiar place, uh, on the one hand, and then there is this constant uh, lack of Afghanistan that makes it a mysterious land. You know, so on the one hand it's familiar, on the other is ambiguous. Could yeah. you, you know, yeah, would you like to reflect on this? Yeah, I think um, I think this again ties into your other question. It, Afghanistan is familiar in the sense that it is the Orient, right? So we have these assumptions that we draw upon when it comes to studying or interacting with people from the global south, from countries in the global south. They are usually considered backwards or uh, a lower down in the hierarchy in some sort of way, whether it come, whether it has to do with politics or economics or, you know, uh, all those things. So Afghanistan fits that image of the sort of familiar, uh, familiar Orient, but it's also different because precisely it hasn't been, it has only ever been superficially engaged with. So there's a there's a mystery about Afghanistan and there's a mystique, which is another orientalizing trope but it definitely is palpable in the case of Afghanistan when it comes to Afghan women and women in bur burqas in general, what are they hiding? What can't we know? So there's this, uh, there's this desire to know and to capture, which Afghanistan kind of evades and has been slippery, but that doesn't have anything to do with Afghanistan's own unique history. It has to do with the fact that 
it hasn't been met with the same kind of sustained engagement um, and resources and uh, and the things that you'd expect. Even even um, British administrators that became experts on Afghanistan never really bothered to learn the languages, right? So there's which is different from India, for instance. There's a lot of <clears throat> people who did learn Hindi or could speak some Hindustani as they called it, whereas mm. Afghanistan was just considered not worthy of learning. The languages were not considered worthy of learning. So there's that kind of cursory nature mm. adds to its mystery, to its unfamiliarity. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, before I'm moving to the question of gender, I think that you, you, you present this precise picture of, uh, of familiarity and mysteriousness, also referring to the question of the frontier, which I find it very interesting because, it, I mean, uh, there is this kind of, you have the, this whole discussion about the frontier as a place where uh, failure and deviance converge in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this, all these elements that really come to exemplify Afghanistan as mm -hmm. uh, the developed in these tropes. How, I mean, how did the frontier came about in your research, I'm wondering? Was that something that came about through the sources? Or, uh, I mean, it's, it's clear already in the literature that there's something there. And uh, because you, you focus particularly on this, and then you, you end up also talking about frontier governmentality. So, you know, I'd like you to, to reflect on this with us a, a little bit. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, uh... The frontier, I think, takes on two different but related manifestations in this book. On the one hand, Afghanistan itself is considered a frontier. So and Afghanistan, all of Afghanistan is this frontier land and it's the frontier to India to, or to British India, mm. including Pakistan. And so there's a lot of stuff written about frontier governmentality, about um, how to deal with Lord Curzon's lectures on how the frontier itself demands a certain kind of masculinity, a certain kind of mentality, mm -hmm. et cetera. And that, but more precisely, the, the bit between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the, line, the Duran line which straddles the two countries, uh, that region is called the Northwest Frontier, right? So the, <laughs> and, and has a province, which is mostly in Pakistan, the Northwest Frontier province. And that is considered especially since 9-11, the, the sort of space of chaos, uh, that's where apparently all the terrorists hide, etc. So there's that, um, and that itself has a history. So the British enacted what was called the Frontier Crimes Regulation, which is a sort of haphazard legal framework to deal with the crimes in the region, which had things like, oh, if somebody kills somebody, then not only does he get into trouble, but also 20 of his tribesmen get into trouble because that's how Afghans apparently organize themselves socially. So there's this, there's some concession to the fact that they're dealing with something kind of different or particular, but then there's also just this haphazard legal code that is, that was in um, effect until very recently. So mm -hmm. a, a pretty old colonial set of rules. Um, and, and the book that's really good on this is the one by uh, Hopkins, uh, ben, ben Hopkins and Magnus Mar Marston, who talk about, who have a lot mm. of research on the frontier, uh, on this particular Afghanistan-Pakistan frontier. So uh, that, I, I guess I was interested in Afghanistan as frontier, as buffer, as all those kind of um, uh, labels that were applied to it to, to make it make sense. And then as I did more research into that, then I was also interested in this specific instance, especially uh, in in what was then called Afbak, the sort of bleeding yeah. together or merging together of Afghanistan and Pakistan as one unified theater of war. Um, and, and that was all interesting for all sorts of reasons as well. And on this Afbak, would you mind, I mean, continuing and describing this? Because I think, I mean, this is certainly something that not everybody is, uh, is familiar with, but uh, I mean, where, where this term comes from, because I see, I mean, reading your book, I yeah. know it comes from the military, but yeah, please go ahead. I mean, yeah. So. Uh, Afbak was a sort of, um, so it, it deals with the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And uh, before the Duran line, which was plotted, which was a scientific frontier, um, it, was, it was a unified sort of area of, past, it was a pastoral land. And so Pashtun farmers moved uh, freely between these two regions because they weren't two different regions. And then the, the plotting of the Duran line, I think in 1907, 
although I could be wrong about this specific year, uh, basically made it in with one half of it, the sort of southern side in Pakistan and the northern side in, in Afghanistan or the east and the western side. And since, since then, it has sort of functioned as this defunct kind of border space. Mm -hmm. But two very different types of entities have formed on either side. So there's Afghanistan, which recognizes itself as Afghanistan, and Pakistan, which is a state in and of itself. Um, in 2008, Richard Holbrook, who was the, the special envoy uh, to Pakistan and Afghanistan serving under Obama, uh, decided that it would be uh, much easier to actually not think of Afghanistan and Pakistan or that region as sovereign entities, but to talk about it as one unified theater of war. That, those were his words. Um, and it was, and it was, to, they, and what he said was, this is an ill-defined border, which it was, but, but then took it to this extreme where he said that um, this is a terrorist borderland. It is not a sovereign state. It, therefore, the law doesn't apply to it international law doesn't apply to it. And it was made into this like area which could then be bombed through drones, et cetera, with, with impunity. And that became Afbak. And, um, and, and of course, inhabitants on both sides of the region protested, not, not simply because they were being bombed, of course, they, that was a big thing, but also because they did not anymore recognize that as this unified region. And that has to do with the afterlives of these things. When you create a border, it might be arbitrary at the time in yeah. which it was created, but a hundred years later, it does have take up its own, like has its own meaning, has its own resonances and has its own local manifestations. Thanks, Niv. You know, when you were talking about this frontier and border, it reminded me of this recent book wrote by Greg Grandin on, uh, on actually on, uh, on, the, on US imperialism and how much, uh, because, uh, you know, your reflections on, uh, on the border and the frontier makes me think, uh, how much also what we study is coming also from the imperial mentality in a way that, uh, I mean, America, for example, has always had this logic of the frontier. You know, we went, we discovered the land, you know, mm. and then now, I mean, the argument that Grandin is making is basically now we're going back to the border. We need to, to build strong borders and there is, you know, we are losing the logic of the frontier. I mean, I think that what we are facing is, is, is colonialism in a way, and now we're going even more fascist, but... Uh, but I, I'm wondering whether this kind of uh, historicization that of, uh, of US imperialism is, uh, is also part and parcel of what you're describing in the terms of Afghanistan, in the sense that uh, first this sort of uh, terrorist frontier, and now we need to look at it uh, more, uh, we need to try to borderize it, we need to make sense of it in, in a much more, uh, you know, sort of radical way, much more masculine, like we need to intervene, we need to know how this looks like. That's why AFPAC comes in. Yes, absolutely. And actually, Greg Grandin's new book on newish book is on my to read list. Um, but yeah, uh, that's uh, totally true. And it's also, I think there's also the sort of politics of naming here. So by calling it AFPAC, it evokes a sort of different, uh, not just policy, policy response, but also an emotive response. What does that mean? People also have called it Talibanistan. And so then it, uh, by, by naming and talking of these spaces in certain ways um, that absolutely gestures to the sort of imperial impulse and imperial impetus when it comes to finding out new new mm -hmm. lands and this and perhaps like you say uh, even a sort of settler colonial logic is at play although obviously it's different in this instance nobody yeah. wants to go and settle in Afghanistan it's just uh, that that is these things have, are ingrained um, and mm -hmm. and probably have instantiations. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you see, um, I, I mean, I know you, you say that uh, uh, you made a choice to look at the British Empire and then the current stage of American imperialism, but uh, how do you see them in your book? I mean, because I know you also refer, maybe we should look at other imaginaries coming when it looks at Afghanistan. But I wonder if uh, um, there is, on the one hand, there is a question that is not provoking on my side, but it's something that uh, I am struggling with right now, and also probably coming from a political economy perspective. Uh, you never define imperialism in the book. So I am wondering, uh, is this because there is a tension between the so-called Marxist tradition and the post-colonial? So 
because but you do talk about violent dispossession at the same time. So I'm wondering, is that something given for granted, the material conditions, or something that you haven't thought about? I don't know. That's, I mean, I'd like to hear that from you. And then the question was, if there is continuity in what you have researched between British Empire, American imperialism, or you have seen differences in the way along yeah. the line? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I feel like I would have wanted to, in retrospect, engage with capitalism more sort of head on, because that also has its own implication in and for Afghanistan um, and, and also sort of the conceit of racial capitalism, which I think explains a lot of what I'm talking about quite well. I don't think I, I said, oh, I'm going to not define imperialism because I'm no. choosing a post-colonial and not a Marxist lens. I don't, I don't think that was, some, that was a deliberate choice. Uh, I think for me, imperialism was broad enough to capture many different ways of engaging with Afghanistan. Uh, so that included for, for sure Britain and the US, but also uh, encompassed the Soviet Union, even though for basically expedience and because I don't have any Russian language skills, uh, I didn't go into that, but, uh, but the sort of Afghanistan, um, uh, engagement with Afghanistan has been thought of as imperialism, even by uh, very conservative American um, mm. politicians, right? So they do talk about Afghanistan as a graveyard of empire in the 21st century. So obviously they are the empire, right? So they're saying, let's not go there because this is where imperial ambition comes, mm. comes to die. Or, um, so, so yeah, it wasn't, it was sort of um, almost assumed that the sort of imperialism as a political, economic, cultural enterprise uh, had was the lens through which I was studying these forays into Afghanistan, if you like. In terms of British and American uh, imperial adventures, um, the there's there's some sort of similarity and there's lots of differences, uh, of course. Okay. But again, what was interesting. Um, for me was that that a lot of the sort of American NATO-led intervention from 2001 uh, was based on understanding Afghanistan as a land of tribes uh, and as a sort of retrogressive space. And a lot of that was based on evidence, as it were, from British colonial sort of archival documents um or like i i read the archival work and it was clear that not much work had been done since elphinstone's account of the kingdom of kabul uh, and that was then read by join me perhaps and then that was read by somebody else and then that became part of a military manual in the us so there was the similarity uh, in the sense that um colonial troops were used and deployed and recycled and uh many, many, many years later. Uh, I suppose the, the more interesting um, thing between British and American intervention would be the 2001, uh, but how British troops think of themselves as uh, very different from American troops. And that is that the British themselves at the moment or up until very recently thought that they were much kinder and much more uh, in line with um, you know, the local customs and they had this kind of liberal sort of, we are the liberal and the Americans are like, yeah, just just sort of um, brash. And, uh, but, I, but I think actually um, that didn't really, uh, it wasn't, wasn't that clear to me. The, the Brits were extremely racist and extremely homophobic uh, mm -hmm. in their own kind of ways, just in a different, different manner. There is the sort of reserved, soft-spoken, patina or veneer, if you like, but policy-wise, it wasn't necessarily the case. Thanks, Nevi. Um, um, I, I wanted to ask you also, I mean, uh, as, you were, as you were talking about this, uh, you know, they were extremely homophobic when referring to the troops, you know, in, invading Afghanistan. Uh, I've been thinking about also because uh, uh, about the Taliban now, I mean, because uh, I know you talk about, uh, um, and more generally about uh, how Afghan men were, uh, you know, depicted in these tropes, you know, there is the question of the deviance, the sexual deviance, there is the homosexuality, and then there is where, you know, you say, when, 
why when you when you talk about white women and white men joining together to save brown women from brown men and also from themselves and i think that is uh, and i've seen that it's probably something that uh, it's probably I, I saw that as maybe as a difference between the British Empire and the current stage of uh, of American imperialism, where uh, you know this is kind of some people do talk about intersectional imperialism, you know the way it can be mobilized to, and so I mean if you want if you wanted to talk because I have I have so many questions on this, but I, I, if you want to go ahead, I mean reflect on uh, on the on the question of sexuality and deviancy, particularly in relation to Afghan men that you described. Yeah, so. Thanks for that. Um, the, the the chapter on Afghan men that deals with their sexuality uh, has to do has to do with the fact that Afghan men are considered uh, deviant as and sort of queer pathological entities, but are never quite given the status of a gay man. So you know, if Afghan men hold each other's hands. Uh, it's because of the lack of women, it's because they're misogynistic and they can't show affection towards women, so they show it towards each other and they might perform homosexuality, but they, they aren't refined enough, almost, um, uh, to, be, to be properly homosexual. And there is a lot of anxiety around this aspect of Afghan men, the fact that they sometimes wear makeup, they clearly have affection towards each other. Um, and and um, it's something that comes up in British and American military memoirs all the time that they were holding hands and walking around uh, in colorful shoes and there's something really wrong and we're, we're much more scared of this kind of show of femininity than we are of the warriors because uh, we can take them down but what do we do with this when they make kissing noises as they walk past etc and I think that that really points to uh, the limits of our horizons when it comes to sort of queer being and queerness, right? So it is very much, again, something we don't seem to understand, uh, try to talk, try to re-inscribe the sort of notion of the closet. These must be closeted men. Uh, it's not clear that that can be a social mode of organization or just a sort of male, um, homoeroticism that isn't that different from what you might find in other places and spaces and and but but the sort of anxiety the colonial anxiety around this around these weird men uh weird and quotations obviously is yeah. is very very palpable and it comes across multiple times and i was quite interested in this in this aspect because it's much less straightforward than the sort of women that need saving. That's pretty clear. These are women that have been subjugated. They're wearing this weird thing called the burqa that is obviously something that is, you know, all the sort of Islamophobic, yeah. just uh, like white savior stuff is very clear when it comes to women. And that has been written about loads, but the Afghan men almost present some sort of puzzle. Uh, <laughs> and because they don't understand it, then it becomes even, even more important to present it as pathological, dangerous, and perverse. This, um, uh, this leads me to, I mean, uh, to, to, to ask you um, about, um, I mean, how much what you're saying resonates with Joseph Massad critique in a way, you know, the fact that these tropes are so much part of imperialism, Islam as a key element in defining li liberalism. But at the same time, I know that in your work, you also try to bring nuances to that. So. I mean, how do you how do you pose yourself with with the debate? Because I know you do that very well in the book, and uh, how Afghanistan has allowed you to do that in a way, the study. Yeah. So I think, um, in some ways, Mossad um, is a useful foil, but I disagree with him because he talks about how homosexuality and the sort of gay liberation of the West is something that is imposed upon in the Arab world. So homosexuality is something that is alien to the Middle East. Uh, and, and so, and he has a very sort of critical account of the gay international, uh, which he says is a co colonial onslaught in the Middle Eastern world. While I agree with some of that critique um, and people like Jasbir Puar have made that in different ways through the concept of homo nationalism, I find that Massad is very, is almost too 
preoccupied with these impositions of categories and never actually let Middle Eastern Afghan men have their own way of defining, self-identifying. And so he ironically almost mirrors the gay international by setting the, the definitional parameters of what legitimate male sexual encounters can be. So for the gay international, or what he calls the gay international, this uh, it's the repressive regimes of the Middle East that have denied uh, Middle Eastern men any sort of say in their own homosexuality. For Mossad, any sort of discourse around gayness, homosexuality, liberation, liberation is almost is always already uh, Western imperial. And so again, he also is quite problematic in how little room and aid, uh, for agency he gives actors in the Middle East themselves. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's precisely what you know. What because I think you have a you have a nice. Uh, uh, you you describe it in, you describe it nicely in your book. I mean, this kind of interaction with mass at work that yes can be very useful on the one hand, but if it, if it's stretched, you know, far, then there is always that uh, uh, no space is created uh, for something else. You know, you are trapped in this sort of hat under imperialism, and then there is no way to to come out of it. And anything that comes, you know, within it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we see this in, in many other debates. Uh, I, 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 what I was thinking as well is that uh, how are these things now that you have developed so nicely in your book, maybe, are, uh, are, they now, uh, are they now guiding your present work? I mean, how much of the imperial tropes, how much of, uh, are still present in the work that you are undertaking right now, or you are moving it to another direction? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a bit of both. So I think I am moving into another direction, definitely sort of regionally. So my new inquiries are not in, are not on Afghanistan or the Middle East or even the US and the war on terror. I think some of the stuff around imperial knowledge is something that I will remain interested in. Um, so my new project, the sort of big new project looks at uh, borders um, and, and border abolition and uh, looks at how there's a history to that, those kinds of movements, and looks at core thinkers from around the world, the attempts to allow you Newton, Newton of the Black Panthers, Ron Rene, um, hmm. and, uh, and Gloria Anzaldúa. And so, they, so it's looking at those thinkers and trying to contextualize um, ways of being with the border and resisting the border. And so on the face of it, it is very different from what's come before, but I, it's still animated by concerns of um, ways of interpreting the world that are colonial and how those colonial lenses sort of reproduce themselves. And I've also done a couple of other things on the sort of on the Black Panthers, uh, which is again quite different. But but like I said, it is uh, interested in race and racial capitalism uh, in particular. So there's some stuff that I take with it to take from this project, uh, but it's also quite different. Okay, and. Uh... If I could ask, I mean, uh, your thoughts now, I mean, uh, because uh, I know you really present, I mean, I like when you, you, you say it right away that this book is a decolonizing intervention in the field, you know, in a way, you put in the non quote, but uh, it's clear that you're trying to debunk a certain type of knowledge production on, uh, on Afghanistan. I know that the decolonizing uh, uh, the university movement now is, uh, is, is building some sort of uh, momentum. I mean, obviously not everywhere in the world, not in each university, but it's coming up. It's rising to a certain extent, we could say. I would like to hear your thoughts in this case, because uh, I, I wonder how much this uh, decolonizing the curricula, decolonizing the university can actually undo the political economy of knowledge production in the university, or can easily be reintegrated, you know, and uh, it's sort of, uh, collapse to the very problems that we are trying to work against. So basically, are we, are we ma mainstreaming decolonization? Yeah, um, excellent question. And the short answer is yes. Uh, decolonizing the university is absolutely being used by managerial, uh, for managerial agendas and, and are presented in different kinds of ways. So the like less, uh, less bold version of that is simply what's called EDI committees and you know the equality, diversity, and in inclusivity initiatives that universities are taking. But even decolonizing the curriculum 
uh, is, uh, is, is co-opted in, in all sorts of ways, uh, just by saying, okay, we can put some people of color on the syllabus and that will decolonize the curriculum. And I think that that actually misunderstands uh, what some of this, what the sort of original impulses of this movement are. And those are from um, movements like Roads Must Fall, which has a very obvious political agenda as well. So it is about political economy. It's about divestment from certain industries and also questions of reparations through scholarships, if you like. But there is that thing which is actually not being heard at all. Um, the other thing is, of course, the concerns around the questions of the word decolonizing, given that as indigenous scholars uh, have shown, especially Eve Duck, um, this article on decolonizing is not a metaphor. Uh, yeah. How does one decolonize something in in Europe when the struggle for actually for indigenous repossession in um, settler colonial contexts, including the US and Canada, is still very much alive? So for them, that is decolonization is an active, ongoing project that has to do with the land, and so. The, the, there has to be some recognition that when we do use re decolonizing, we are using it as a metaphor, but that actually those struggles can still be aligned and can have local manifestations that look quite different. And, and I think even if we give up the word decolonizing, I think um, taking on board what the original sort of architects of it had on hand in mind uh, is, is really good. Um, I also think about what uh, Stefano Arni and Fred Morton talk about uh, when they talk about the university and how you know um, we we should all think of being fugitives in the university so what can we do uh, and take from the university to in order to make the world a better place how can we you know use some of the space that is available to us and seed it and give it to other people how do we manage the resources the university provides uh, and then channel them towards sort of decolonizing ends. I'm kind of paraphrasing. So it's a complicated question, but you're right, absolutely. Decolonizing the curriculum, the university are very much being appropriated as agendas for higher man management uh, in the UK and I think beyond. Yeah, no, indeed. I mean, I, uh, uh, I, mean, I know we have to be cautious. I know that uh, the, there is a lot of good willingness I mean on the on behalf of many that they really want to actually um, you know let this process uh, you know fo be fostered within the university and everything but uh, I I mean I can say that this is certainly not the case in a place like uh, like Italy for example there's nothing like that at the moment ongoing like decolonizing this or decolonizing that it's something still uh, which probably it's also telling of the very contradictions that the uh, developed, explode inside the imperial core, you know, take the US, take mm -hmm. Britain in a way that's still very much, you know, it's, it's still Brexit in a way. So <laughs> still consider itself as a, as a standalone country with its own uh, imperial past. So this is probably, but we have seen different debates in France, for example, you know, with all the Islamogushism and, you know, the leftist Islamist. Uh, so I mean, I hope, I agree, I totally agree with you in the sense that, yeah, we can uh, we can take stock, we can try to pass this knowledge also beyond the, the university, but uh, it's it's going to be a very, something that I've always been fascinated with is the fact that, uh, and probably I'm asking this theoretically more than practically, because otherwise I might be easily be accused of being a terror uh, supporter, but uh, which is the question of violence, I mean, in the sense that uh, Decolonize. I mean, all these imperial tropes that you describe are not just a question of representation. They had a violent unfolding while people are writing these books. Afghanistan was being bombed. So it is, uh, it is, yes, I mean, the pen can be a weapon, but at the same time, I wonder how much really, if we are really willing to decolonize something, that means also taking into account the possible violent consequences of this process that we see in in various form hiring processes or anything like that could be in a university setting but yes i mean decolonization is not a metaphor as you're saying so uh and with this i think i would uh, i would really love if that's okay with you unless you have any other thoughts to share to to this to open up the floor for uh, for the q a for the for the audience 
Hugo Nevis, yeah. you have anything to say or uh, we can just I open think up. let's open it up. Okay, okay. Uh, do we have any do we have any questions? Uh, please come along or uh... Ah, Roberta, yes, go ahead, Roberta. Okay, I, I can not activate my video, but I hope you can hear me. So hi, thank you for your uh, interview, both Matteo and Nivi. I have a couple of questions, sorry for my voice. Uh, the, the first one, you mentioned this difference between anecdotes and research-based um, uh, research uh, information we provide about uh, a country. And I would like, and also the role of media. I would like you to say something about the distinction between anecdote and uh, research on that. So what are the sources? How can we use sources in a way that what we produce is real knowledge, is knowledge based on research and not simply anecdotes. Uh, and then I, I was really uh, struck with this, uh, the, the role of the women in the in constructed the narrative uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, this brought to, to my mind this uh, very like uh, iconic photograph taken in 1984 by um, Steve McCurry, if I don't go mistaken. So is there a relation between uh, like the use of women and the um, and the idea of miso miso and like anti, uh, anti I don't know how to say misogyn country and yeah, so the end of the beauty of these women are used is used in a in a um, like functional in, a, in an instrumental way. Yeah, thank you. Those are both excellent uh, questions. In terms of research and anecdote, um, one of the things that I suppose I should say is that even research, uh, the way in which we conduct it, the methods we use are ultimately come from a sort of Western academy and a way of knowledge production that can in itself be um, decolonized or should be decolonized. And Linda Smith has a great book on decolonizing methods. Um, but that, but that's, I suppose, a, a second level debate almost as it were. The, the thing about Afghanistan is that um, what we recognize as research is just not present for the most part when it comes to Afghanistan. So it is literally um, things from the early 20th century where an administrator had a conversation with a tribal chief and says, oh, um, Pashtuns only care about one thing and that is honor. And then that becomes taken from a sort of Pashtun proverb and then becomes this, this the way to understand Pashtun men or, and Pashtun women and just the whole tribal sort of organization. And, and then that, has literally no real academic basis or research or scholarly sort of engagement that has gone into it. And so, so when I'm saying that the, the sort of basis on which some of these tropes are, are based, they, they are extremely, extremely thin. It's not, it's not, oh, is this good research and that's bad research. And I think we can talk about that. Uh, it's just unrecognizable as research in and, and of itself, it's not something that would be like, oh, your method, you, you know, you're not doing your discourse analysis properly, or using en vivo to code this properly. It's not that kind of detailed uh, question about research. It's simply that there has been nothing, no actual, um, no, no, no formal interviews, no ethnography, no uh, anthropological research, the sort that you'd expect. Um, mm -hmm. let you know the sort of embedded ethnography kind of thing that you'd expect if you're studying a different culture there's none of that. that not that I'm saying that that doesn't have its own problems but even without taking into that the into the equation those problems that Afghanistan has just studied in the most sort of cursory superficial of manner so that's the sort of thing I was talking about in terms of the women the 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 thing about the Afghan woman being for western consumption <laughs> is definitely one of the ways in which misogyny works. So it doesn't have to be always violent or have to be, it doesn't, it, it is, it's a, it's a sort of aspect of patriarchy, if you like, right? So Afghan women are, are shown as extremely beautiful. Um, and then the time sort of photographer 
oh, National Geographic photographer has this photograph of an Afghan girl and then comes back 50 years later and has that same photograph with those piercing eyes. Um, but then the girl is just used, or the woman later is just used as a sort of, um, as a sub, as an object for Western consumption. There's no money has been given to her. There's been no, um, no effort in knowing what the context is, no, nothing. It's just, they, these are the women. And so the Afghan women are either presented like that, like these beautiful girls who then become stashed against or hidden behind burqas. Uh, and, and that is a different sort of manifestation. Some might say that that's a more ma benign manifestation of patriarchy, but it's definitely one of the ways in which patriarchal oppression uh, and specifically oriental, only orientalist uh, or racist, if you like, patriarchal oppression manifests itself. So thank you. Um, if, if there are any questions, otherwise I have one for you. It just came up to my mind because I wanted to ask you earlier. Uh, uh, Nivi, I wanted to ask you, uh, you look, you know, you look at gender sexuality, the state, the thrive, one thing that I noticed, but I mean, I know that I've been working on Libya, so it's very specific and more recently on Venezuela, was uh, the imperial tropes sometimes can take the form uh, of uh, referring to a material element. In my case, it was oil. So imagining the country via oil. So I'm thinking whether Afghanistan had any of that, or uh, I mean, probably something that you couldn't explore, but you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the political economy of poppy, of the poppy, right, of uh -huh. Arabic, um, is definitely the obvious one. Uh, and that, again, has, is quite complicated because it was banned by the Taliban, but then start because it was against sort of religious scripture, but then it was started again. And, just, and then, you know, so they, and the, the imperial forces, if you like, were definitely... Um, they had, def they had definitely their own agendas in different ways. And yeah, but that would be the obvious one, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, I would check one more time if there are any questions. Uh, we want to, is there anybody? Yes, yes, Roberto, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I have <laughs> many other questions, but uh, one, uh, is about this distinction and definition of colonialism. If maybe now we are questioning the distinction between formal and informal colonialism stronger and stronger uh, over the last years. And also this idea that uh, like naming, defining borders and conquering land are all colonial actions that are like, uh, that occur all together. So what, and how the idea of questioning the borders and your new research on uh, imagining a space without fixed border is a way to uh, lose our Western centric way to approach a state. Because in, I am studying like Libya's Matteo and the first way to defining Libya as a colony was fixing the borders. Libya was a space to cross, not a space to stay. And one day, defining Libya as a colony was naming it, conquering the land and defining borders, how the research on border can be a tool to decolonize our approach to research. That's a really good point. And I hadn't quite thought of it like that, but you're absolutely right. Whether it's borders or ways of specializing entities um, are definitely, uh, are definitely colonial, like things that can be colonizing or are used by colonizers all the time. I mean, historically, of course, we know that um, the ways in which the African border, most of African borders have drawn, have been drawn up, have been explicitly in the service of British and other European colonial powers. So, uh, and now I think, uh, I think there's other ways of thinking about spatialization and what people might call placemaking that has a different, that has different sort of ways of engaging with the place that you're in, whether it's a bordered entity, whether it's a state, whether it's um, whether it's um, uh, a city. Um, but I think 
the flip side of that is that as Benedict Anderson shows in his book, uh, Imagine Communities, that those borders, um, even if they were arbitrary, and I suppose this is something to do with my story on AFPAC as well, they also do then end up taking on, uh, end up having meanings for people who reside and people start thinking of themselves as citizens of a certain place, even if that place or that country is a colonial creation. So it's quite hard to separate the sort of historical colonial uh, stuff from the contemporary material realities and emotive connections that people who live in those spaces uh, attribute to those countries. So, but I think that's a really interesting way to think about borders. So thank you for that. Well, I, I thank you everybody. And I thank you, Neely Machanda, a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London and author of Imagining Afghanistan. It was a pleasure to have you here, Neely, and thanks everybody for having joined us today. Thank you so much for inviting me.